Welcome to the Morrison Report podcast. Today we have with us Ben Myers. He's the president of Bullpen Research and Consulting. So excited to have you here with us. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Oh, thanks for having me, Deville. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, why you're so smart, um, <laughs> and tell us a little bit about Bullpen Consulting. Well, I don't know if I'm uh, I'm so smart, but yeah, I've been a residential real estate uh, analyst in the new housing market for about 20 years. Uh, and I started my company, Bullpen Research and Consulting, in, in 2017. Uh, generally, do residential market studies for condominium apartment and uh, and rental apartments. Occasionally, some low rise developments, uh, primarily for. Uh, developers and for lenders. So help them underwrite their deals, help them price their deals, uh, do some land valuations here and there, um, a residual uh, type analysis, but otherwise, uh, you know, stick to the condo and rental studies primarily, just trying to see where the market's going, which obviously is, uh, has been a very interesting, um, you know, roller coaster over the last, uh, last three or four years. Yeah, I'm sure. Absolutely. Uh, And as we talk about that roller coaster based on where interest rates are right now, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in the pre-construction sales market right now? Sure, sure. Yeah. So probably the period between maybe May of 2021 and and April of 2022 was maybe one of the the greatest uh, one-year stretches in terms of condo sales in the GTA's history. and then obviously interest rates started to go up. Uh, there was a change in sentiment in the marketplace and, and much slower sales uh, happened during the um, you know, May to, to December 2022 period. There still is demand, um, and, and, but I think it's, it's obviously tempered. And I think investors, which are the primary buyers of, of pre-construction condominiums, are looking for deals. They're looking for uh, a discount to that April 2022 pricing, and they're looking at projects that have longer closing. Uh, I think there's there's still, you know, confidence that the Greater Toronto Area is a good place to invest. That uh, in the long term prices will continue to go up, and in the long term rent continues to go up, so it will be a good investment. They're concerned about you know the short term fluctuations in the marketplace. So anything that's closing in 2023 and 2024, I think there's some uh, real reluctance to purchase those units without a without a discount to their you know to their uh, Q1 2022 price. Uh, but general generally there's there's bullishness, but you know developers are being cautious and and uh, and many are delaying their launches. So the majority of sales that happen in any one one month are related to new launches. So if we have uh, a lot fewer launches that we're going to get fewer sales. Mm, interesting. So back up to what what's the approximate price per square foot that maybe you were seeing a year ago versus what you're seeing now that builders are charging on a pre-construction basis based on the fact that sales are slowing down? Yeah. So if we're, if we're right in like the downtown core, like yeah. You know, prime downtown, you know, entertainment district, uh, downtown Yelm, maybe uh, downtown east with 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 within a you know a 10 minute streetcar ride of, of the core. You know, those prices were, you know, sixteen hundred to seventeen hundred dollars a foot. Uh, that, that's where they kind of topped out at. Uh, and 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 that was a pretty significant increase. There was projects that launched in the mid 1400s, um, in you know late 2021, right? So the huge growth in in the matter of uh, you know five months, right? Just unbelievable <laughs> price growth. Uh, if we start moving farther out to the you know to the junction to uh, Dupont, um, you know they were in the the, the 1200 to 1300 square foot range. Um, once you get out to you know the Scarboroughs, the Sobicos, you know pricing within the you know eleven hundred to eleven fifty range, uh, but some of the suburban stuff was actually higher than the what I call the outer four one six. So we were seeing right. we were seeing pricing at twelve hundred dollars a foot at uh, you know in the Vaughn Corporate Center. I mean it does does have a subway now or connected to the TTC. 
um, and even twelve hundred dollars a foot in the Mississauga City Center. Grow. So, so pretty, that's pretty huge, pretty, pretty huge pricing, right? In comparison to where where it was a couple of years ago. So that's crazy. And what about for Midtown Toronto? Yeah, Midtown, you know, and you know, the Young and Eglinton area. Yeah, we were we were seeing pricing in the uh, you know the thirteen hundred dollars, uh, even even high thirteen hundred dollars per square foot uh, pricing. There hadn't been a lot launched there, um, but now you know I think there was a, the the most recent launch was over fifteen hundred bucks a foot, right? In in the Young and Eglinton area, so it really just you know when my benchmarks are still going back to 2011, right? It's just for some reason that year just sticks out of my mind and where pricing was and, and, uh, and to have stuff selling, um, you know, twice as much, if not almost three times as much as it, as it was, uh, you know, 11, 12 years ago, really kind of, kind of blows my mind, but, you know, several factors, uh, as, as I'm sure you've talked about on this podcast a million times, we're getting very strong immigration, Job growth has been uh, been fairly good, um, and those are the you know the demand side uh, uh, pushes. Obviously, we we're, we were increasing the student uh, population in uh, in the Greater Toronto area as well. And then there's cost push inflation, which um, you know probably doesn't get talked about as much as it should be. But construction costs are are way up. Obviously, we're everyone's feeling the inflation crunch and that's impacting developers as well. I mean, that, there's yeah. all the supplies that go into uh, a new condominium and development. Also, we're at record levels of units under construction in the marketplace. So more, um, you know, demand for the trades. And if they have a lot of demand, then they're going to, like anyone else, raise their, raise their fees. Add on top of that, government fees keep going up. Development charges. Yeah. The city is looking out and saying, "Wow, look at all the stuff that's under construction. Let's take a bigger piece of that pie." Right? They're trying to essentially offset all new infrastructure costs onto the new development industry. Right. So let's go back for a second, just for oh listeners who don't know what development charges are. Do you want to just tell us what uh, development charges are for those who are not, not aware? Yeah. So essentially, the development charges are meant to cover. Um, you know, any of the, the increase in infrastructure needs uh, because of a new condominium, right? So it's meant to, meant to cover, you know, the connecting the, the building to the existing, uh, you know, water and, and sewer. It's meant to cover the costs of the planning department. It's meant to co- cover the costs of the building inspectors. It's, and, you know, it's meant to, 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 to cover the costs of, of uh, new, you know, uh, fire stations, new, um, a police, new uh, uh, a new libraries, new community centers, new uh, you know transit upgrades for for all the new residents. So it's it's essentially meant to cover a lot of those those costs. The thing is that we you know and the people in the development industry talk about is okay, you're going to you know charge a developer and get what's also we also have an additional fee called a section thirty seven. It's now rolled into a cost called the community benefit. Uh, and and also often a developer will pay on top of development charges this additional fee, and it might dedicate to build a new park. It might be dedicated to to build a new library or a new community center. The problem is, is existing residents get to use those parks, and they get right. to use those community centers, and they get to use those transit upgrades. So why is all that cost being pushed onto new development? And people will say, well, developers are making lots of money, uh, so they can cover those costs, but you know, where does the revenue come for in development? The revenue comes from the purchasers, yeah. <laughs> right? So that revenue is being being uh, borne by those purchasers. And, uh, and and ultimately, that's where all the costs, uh, all that cost gets pushed on. So it, like I said, if I have a son and he buys a resale condominium, then he doesn't have to pay for growth. But if he buys a, a new condominium, then he is responsible for growth. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It, you know, everyone in the city... Could be responsible for the for the growth of the city, you know. Yeah, uh, I mean, and you're right; it doesn't make any sense. And I mean, recently they have agreed to increase property taxes. So, to your point, for the rest of us that own real estate in the city, whether you're buying a resale, you know, condo, whether you've got a house in the city, you know, basically they're saying property taxes are going to be going up seven percent. It's five and a half percent 
plus this previously approved building levy of one and a half percent. So our property taxes are going up by 7%, but you're right. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to have all of those infrastructure costs pinned on a new pre-construction buyer versus an existing homeowner. That That's a huge problem. And we really, really think about it. You know, like I mentioned, investors are buying those units. 60, 70, 80% of those units are ultimately going into the rental market. So we're offloading, offloading the cost of infrastructure for new developments onto people renting units from 400 to 700 square feet, whereas there's, there's people with six kids living in a 4,000 square foot house in Amex paying criminally low uh, property taxes, right? It's, it's, it's almost shameful uh, uh, how we, uh, we say, oh, we, we, there's, there's too many burdens on, on low income people, but it's really, you know, there's so many affluent people that own housing in this city that can afford to pay more, more property taxes. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, as you know, it's a political process and it's easier to offload costs onto people that, that may not even be voting yet. You know, some of these new condominiums that are not going to be completed to 2027, they're going to be housing a lot of people that are 15 years old right now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's funny that, that, that people don't make, make those connections, right? That but I think, them. Ben, it's because people, I think people don't make those connections because they're just, they're not aware. They don't yeah. know. Right. Yeah. I would say that people don't talk about development charges enough and understand the role that they play in making a condo or a house affordable or unaffordable. So, for example, if we're talking about a million dollar condo, how much of that money would you say is basically going towards the government if someone's spending a million? Yeah, so so anywhere would be depending on what municipality, but anywhere from 200,000 to 250,000 will go to the government in the form of building permits in the form of HSP, in the form of um, uh, development charges, community benefit charges, parkland dedication fees. And it really obviously depends on which municipality, uh, you know, has uh, has what fees. So that is significantly higher than a lot of American cities. A lot of American cities is actually less than 10% of, of the fees go to the government, right? So um we have to understand that part of what drives costs is a replacement cost uh, of housing right and so if we continue to make it so expensive to deliver new housing then you know our city is going to continue to see uh ridiculously high house prices right so uh, absolutely unfortunate yeah absolutely i mean that's one of the things that i think is interesting that people don't understand is that if you're saying if the city is saying that they actually want more affordable housing well as you just pointed out with a million dollar condo two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of that is going towards the government so if they truly wanted to make things affordable well maybe there's that two hundred fifty thousand dollars that could go away to make a, con a million dollar condo yeah. affordable right yeah the other thing that, that the politicians like to say is well if we discounted that two hundred and fifty thousand, just say for whatever reason we got rid of completely got rid of it they'll say well the market is still for a million dollars for that condo unit. the developers just gonna pocket that entire difference the thing that they don't talk about is there's so many sites all over the gta that developers are underwriting that i'm helping them underwrite that they can't make work because the revenue is not higher than the cost to deliver those units. So you can see there's hardly any condominiums in the middle of Scarborough. There's some condominiums in Scarborough on the subway. There's some, uh, you know, on, on Kingston Road where you've got views of, of, of Lake Ontario. Well, there's nothing in the middle and there's plenty of those sites available. You know, when was the last project you saw in, in North Etobicoke, right? Huge sites available there to be developed, but you know, and close to the colleges uh, uh, um, you know, up there, but the, the revenue that you could generate from selling those are, are are lower than the cost, right? We really have to consider not just hey, if we lower uh, the the cost on a developer, that downtown project that already pencils that developer is just going to make more money. We have to think of all the sites that it would now create that would be now viable, right? And we also have to consider that we need developers to make money because the developer needs to make money to do projects. And if they make money, then they can do more projects. Right? Absolutely. And, uh, and they, they make money that 
uh, the next project, they may not have to go to the B lender. They can go to the A lender and get better pricing and therefore, um, you know, deliver a, a product that, that they can afford to for it to be cheaper, right? So, and like I just said, we're just in a period where developers aren't launching because there's uncertainty in the marketplace. But if their costs were significantly lower, then more of them would be able to launch at a lower revenue number, right? So yeah. we always have to take that. There's an ebb and flow in the marketplace. And uh, the more that we reduce the cost on the developer, the more supply we're going to see in the marketplace. So uh, there are obviously some, some bottlenecks in terms of labor, right? We need more trades. Um, you know, there's always going to be a little bit of a, 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 a bottleneck in terms of in terms of capital, but I still think there is a lot of capital out there that wants to invest in real estate uh, and and wants to build rental housing and wants to build uh, condominiums. And, and, and now we're seeing even alternative forms. Uh, uh, I've been working with a client on a co-living uh, uh, projects, so that should be interesting to see. If they can get those financed and 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 how they ultimately uh, ultimately lease up, but I, I think they make a lot of sense uh, with uh, with young people coming into the city. Um, you know, rent a, a a bedroom in a in a in a in a four unit uh, a building, and you've got Wi Fi already there, and it's furnished, and someone comes in and cleans it and and everything. So it uh, it kind of makes sense as a transitionary unit before you, you you buy something or you go out on your own for to rent a unit. Absolutely. And I mean, we really do need to start thinking out of the box and a little bit different. And I'm sure, well, actually, I don't know, but with that project that you're talking about, perhaps that room rental is going to be cheaper than someone spending $2,400 a month. Yeah, it would be. It would be. De- definitely, definitely would be. And, and, uh, and, uh, and kind of takes the, uh, the issue, all those issues away that I'm sure you, you, you're, you're dealing with, with uh, moving in people into a, a new unit, getting them cable, getting them Wi-Fi, getting them uh, window coverings, you know, uh, all those things that you, you might not think about um, when, when moving in. That's a, a hassle. Just think of how easy it is to just, boom, move right in and hang your clothes up and you're, you're ready to go. <laughs> No, absolutely. For sure. Let's go back a little bit to chat about, you know, this past fall in terms of pre-construction condo sales. You had mentioned that developers now are starting to hold off on their launches. Are they building anyway, or are they just kind of on hold waiting for a better economic environment to build? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, anything that they sold in the past, they're, you know, going out to get construction financing. And, and you know, I haven't heard of it, uh, you know, the financing being held up because of, uh, you know, changes in the environment. Obviously, it's more expensive, right, with uh, with uh, interest rates where they are. And, and, and that will ultimately uh, eat into the, the profit of the, of the development if they, they don't complete those projects on time. But uh, you know, I haven't heard about, you know, a lot of developers having trouble getting financing. And, and, you know, going back to 2009, when we had our global financial crisis, you definitely heard about that, right? You know, even though projects were 75, 80% sold, you know, they, they, they weren't able to, to get construction financing, but that doesn't seem to be the case this year. So, so a lot of developers, obviously, when, when you have record sales, you know, in a, in a, in a, over, a, you know, the 2020, mid 2020 to, 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 to early 2022, a lot of developers rush their projects to market. They did sales and they're getting them under construction. So, um, uh, they have they have they have work they still have work to do right they're not just sitting on their hands uh, waiting right but uh, um, um, so it'll be interesting to see and I think like I said there was record record numbers of of product under construction so I think um, you know some developers want to wait a little bit so that there's more trade availability and and an easing in pricing um, uh, on the cost so they can afford to potentially lower the revenue. Uh, expectations and, and make the uh, the project financing work. Right. So over the next few months, I mean, do you see, I guess, the, com- the completion rates of condos being just as high as it was before? Um, and do you see an issue with some of those buyers needing to close on those condo units that they purchased a couple of years ago when the interest rates are a lot lower. Because, you know, one of the things that I'm starting to see now is far more assignment sales than I've ever seen before on MLS. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're 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 looking at you know some forecasts. I said as high as thirty two thousand completions in the GTA. Obviously, any forecast at the start of the year and any any year that we've ever done it has been significantly lower. Um, so you know, maybe we get twenty to twenty five thousand. So definitely on the higher side of. And I'm, again, I'm talking uh, just condominium apartment completions. And if you look at when those buildings you know, launch for pre-construction sales and, and ultimately did 70, 80% of their sales. Most of them happened in 2018 uh, or 2019, some even well before then, right? So pricing was significantly lower. Uh, the market has appreciated much, much higher than, than what they paid for those units, even with the market coming down, you know, 15% since, since April for, for the apartment market, the condo apartment market, depending, obviously depending on your municipality and your, your neighborhood. Um, so in terms of that, you know, the, the values there, so they don't have to go out and, you know, source more equity, put more equity in the deal. But yeah, the, the, their carry cost is going to be significantly higher. Um, there's certainly a percentage of investors out there that always intended on assigning their units and thought it would be a lot easier uh, and finding it more difficult. Um, so we'll see how much, how much, how much issues we ultimately have in closings. You know, going back even to the financial crisis in, in, in 2009 and, and some of these major developers, they showed 2 3% of, of buyers over, over you know, thousands of, of, of unit completions uh, not closing. So I'm not as, you know, I'm certainly not as concerned about 2023, maybe late 2024, early 2025. You know, those are definitely going to be the years to watch if interest rates stay at this elevated elevated in relation to the last five years levels, not, right. elevated, not elevated in relation to, a, you know, the last 40, 50 years, but uh, elevated to, in comparison to recent years, then we may may end up with some significant issues with, with closings if these units are valued below, you know, what they paid for them. Um, and, uh, and hopefully... Hopefully that doesn't happen. Hopefully we uh, get inflation under control. Uh, the Bank of Canada can, you know, ease off on on uh, on the interest rates. You know, try to uh, find a uh, 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 you know a, a nice place between where we are now in interest rates and the emergency levels that kind of led to the you know the bubble like conditions that we had in, in early 2022. Hopefully, we can find a a nice spot in the middle there where. Uh, we can, you know, get supply built. We can get investors to, to make money, and 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 everyone can kind of win during the process, right? I mean, that's that's the that's the ultimate goal is to is to deliver a lot of supply, and and you know, have investors make money, have the developers make money, have the lenders make money, and and uh, but we don't want to have the type of volatility that we've experienced the last couple of years. I don't think that's that's healthy. We can't have. 30% price growth in a year. Obviously, that's just damaging for, um, you know, for the, the, the health of our market. And now, as you've seen, you know, we've shifted a bunch of ownership demand to the rental market. And now, you know, we, we, we saw, you know, certainly in the second half of, 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 of 2022, just enormous rent growth, right? It looks like it's cooled off a little bit in the last couple months. But, mm -hmm. you know, I just... I feel terrible for these young people who are going out and and a uh, and a one bedroom five hundred square foot unit is twenty five hundred dollars a month to rent. Like, it just blows my mind, right? It, it, it does. Blows my mind. Yeah, it does blow my mind. But you know, I think back to all my friends in their twenties who moved to New York City, and I remember going to visit them. And so, you know, they'd have like a friend living in the living room and someone living in the bedroom. <laughs> Because the rents were so high in New York City, they just that's what they did, right? Yeah. And and some of those friends of mine are still living in New York City and now they've actually bought in New York City. Wow. And I didn't even think that something like that was really possible. So I guess I feel like, yes, that is difficult. Um, but I feel like they're they'll have to start thinking about creative ways around it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely have uh you know, some cots set up and, uh, <laughs> and some sharing of and sharing of space. So, um, yeah, it was, certainly it's going to be an interesting couple of years in the, in the in the GTA new housing market. Right, absolutely. So, talk to me about development charges in terms of like. So, the city of Toronto recently has increased their development charges significantly. So, 
How is that going to affect building and supply in the years to come? Or how do you think it's going to affect those things? Yeah, I mean, the initial proposal, I think, was a 49% increase in development charges, which is just, mm-hmm. you know, ridiculous. But I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but part of the the, the new uh, Bill 23 proposed by the, by the, by the, uh, the federal, not the federal, the provincial Provincial. government, provincial government, yeah, uh, was to, you know, um, make those, those increases a little more incremental, right? So, so anything that, that, that ultimately increases your costs, whether it is higher interest rates, whether it is, uh, you know, materials, the, the labor costs, um, you know, with financing uh, cost is going to ultimately kill some deals, right? Because right. Um, contrary to what most people think, most developers don't self-finance. So they don't just go and, and, and go into their bank account and pay $150 million to build a project. They go out and, and get financing from a, a bank, from a credit union, uh, from a syndicate, uh, syndicate of different uh uh, uh, financial uh, institutions uh, to build those projects. And there needs to be profit. There needs to be right. significant profit. There needs to be at least 12, 13% before they are going to get. The developer just can't decide, you know what, I'm going to be a good person and I'm going to charge less for these units because, you know, someone on Twitter thinks I should. Someone on Twitter thinks that I'm making too much money. That's not how it works, right? Of course. So once it's below the, that, that rate, then you know, it's become much more difficult to qualify for financing unless you want to put up, put in higher equity. And some developers just don't have that, right? Some of the larger developers do. Uh, yep. They can, you know, uh, uh, put up their, you know, rental building or their office building as 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 collateral. They can uh, do personal guarantees. They can sign their house away and their cottage and their boat and 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 what have you. But <laughs> you know. I don't think a lot of people understand, you know, what it means to, to, to sign a personal guarantee, you know, how would you like to go to work? And if you screwed up at work and sometimes screwing, screwing up is someone else's fault, something yeah. totally out of your control. And then one day you show up and uh, someone's taking your house. <laughs> right. So it's true. It's a scary thing that people don't understand. And then on the other hand, you've got these developers creating jobs for all of these people. So yeah. the entire development community is creating so many jobs for people, yeah. whether they're construction jobs, whether they're marketing jobs, like there are thousands of jobs being created for people. Yeah. Every the every crane industry. in the sky creates 500 uh, jobs right over the, the course of the, the uh, development. So, you know, it's a lot of construction workers, it's a lot of city workers, right? It's a lot of, uh, you know, people, you know, consultants like myself, you know, people right. that make people that are in the, the quarries, right? Getting the concrete, you know, people that are, that are uh, chopping down the trees, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the marketing companies, the, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, someone in Concord cutting, uh, you know, doing uh, 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 countertops and stuff. So it's just a, it's it, it's it's a it's a very lucrative uh, business um, in terms of the jobs that it creates and the the spinoff, right? Just think of you know a, a parking lot, what kind of revenue that creates for the city in terms of property taxes? Not yeah. that much, right? And now think of a seventy-story tower with nine hundred units, right? What type of taxes that that creates, and when those people you know, move into those units and they, and they get those window coverings and they buy those, uh, their, their, uh, you know, all their silverware and they get their paint and they yeah. get their interior design it and their furniture, how much support there is for the, for the local community in, in terms of, uh, in terms of everyone that moves into those, those buildings. So that all has to be taken into consideration. Right. And, yeah. Uh, and I hope, you know, I, I love living in Toronto. I, I love that it's being, so I love that it's being reinvented every single day that you drive to a new neighborhood and it's, and it's, and it's different, right? Yep. Yes. And I think I've talked about it on my podcast, the Toronto on construction, <laughs> how much, how much um, you know, I dislike the fact that, that, that a lot of the new buildings, the, bo- the, the bottom of the project doesn't integrate well into the existing neighborhood. And I think a lot of developers could do, some better work on on the retail portion. I think they'd get a lot less slack uh, right. when these projects are coming to completion. 
if they did a little bit better job at, at how the building meets the street and, uh, and, and getting a better mix of retail tenant. But again, I don't understand the retail market, right? And, and uh, there's only so many mom and pops out there that can, that can work as much as we would love to have more mom and pop shops at the bottom. There's only so many of them that, that can, can flourish, right? So, uh, and, but I mean, uh, and we I all almost, like, guess what? We all like Tim Hortons and, and, <laughs> and Starbucks and, and Shoppers Drug Marts and AMWs and. Yeah, but you know what? I mean, I feel like that's a whole other podcast in terms of the amount of commercial rents that some of these businesses have to pay because. Yeah. I was speaking with a business owner recently and they were telling me that their local nail salon has to pay something. It was a downtown nail salon is paying something like $20,000 a month in rent. Wow. And I thought to myself, how many nails do you have to do before $20,000 a month yeah. and pay yourself and pay your staff? And yeah. I think the quote was something like that. This place needs to do 60 nails a day in order to pay their rent. And I thought, this is crazy. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, once you start to break it down that way, it really is shocking. And, that, and, and then the fact that you see so many vacant retail spaces around the city and you think, how, how are rents not going down? Right. So, yeah, no, certainly right. not my certainly not my area of expertise, but, uh, um, you know, uh, you, you want you really, you really appreciate when a developer does it well. And, and and gets a good mix of uh, of tenants in there and really tries to uh, um, you know draw people in and, and create value for the street and you know ultimately create value for their for their project. So I, right, so that's I a good that segue. Think, I hope we think I hope we think you know a little bit better, a little bit more about 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 how the, the buildings meet the street. Right. So that's a good segue. When I talk about when I think about some of those commercial areas, in particular, when I think of the Dan Forth. And I see all of the businesses that are closed down, that are for lease. You know, what comes to my mind is that this neighborhood needs more density. So there's more people to support the commercial businesses. So, yeah. you know, how, I mean, I think the Danforth definitely needs more density, but how high do you think developers need to build these days in order to be able to afford to build because the costs are so high? Is it 20 stories? Is it 40 stories? Like, what what do you think that is? I mean, I feel like no one's going to develop low low rise anymore because it's just not affordable. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's the thing. There's some fixed costs in terms of, of getting your entitlement and and, uh, and going through that uh, going through that process and and you know mid rise buildings tend to be less efficient. But if I, by that I mean the the um, you know amount of sellable space to the overall GFA of the project. So. Once you get into the high rise buildings, they become much more efficient. Um, so that's that's certainly something that, that people take into consideration. So yeah, you can see that a lot of the mid rise buildings that we have going up in our city significantly expensive. Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, and in some cases, even more expensive than high rises. And that w- was never the case. That's only happened over the last three or four years, where developers realized for me to do this type of small scale project. I have to do a luxury building. I have yeah. to do a high-end building. I have to sell them on the boutique nature of this project, and and you know not going, you know, not spending five minutes in, in an elevator, and not going down eight levels of underground parking. I'm selling those features, and I'm selling them for a benefit, right? So, yeah. anyone that's going to be doing mid-rise is going to be doing a fairly luxury product these days. Um, uh, but for generally speaking, you know, developers want to go higher. I don't know what the the ideal building height is these days, right? It depends on the area and how much parking they need. Um, we're, we're still in a we're still in a period really outside the downtown core that 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 you still need parking in a project. And so, you know, the, the height of that building is really, um, you know, uh, re- you know, relies on how many parking spaces you need and 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 how many studios you can one bedrooms you can do without parking and, and how many larger units you can you can do without but uh, right. you know just talking to developers they prefer to do high rise it's just you know the the marginal cost of adding that a few extra floors is is is, is generally low um, in comparison to uh, you know going from six to eight or from eight to twelve which makes significant difference to uh, to a project right right. 
Yeah, no, that makes sense for sure. Wow, we're coming to the end. We've uh, chatted a lot, Ben. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 as you know, I, I talk a lot about new development and uh, and, and I'm passionate about it. And and, uh, and I hope that uh, I hope that your listeners will learn a little something. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. That's great. Anything else to add before we close off? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious what you feel about the market. You're, you know, you're dealing with the buyers. You're on the, you're on the resale side. Is, is, are people just, you know, waiting for a, a stabilization in the market before they, they jump back in, or are they looking for a certain price point? You know, are they just generally scared? You know, what, what are your thoughts from, you know, dealing actually with, with buyers? I don't talk to a lot of buyers myself, right? So. You know, it's interesting. So what I'm seeing is there's some buyers who are like, oh, I want to wait until the bottom of the market. And I say to them, I was like, okay, but as you wait for the bottom of the market, that you have no idea when the bottom's going to be, because we all know that nobody could time the market perfectly. That's number yeah. one. But I say to them, as you wait for that bottom of the market to happen, the interest rates are going like this. So yeah. your actual monthly cost to hold that property is going like this. So it might not be such a great idea to wait till the bottom of the market. So that's one segment of the people. Then the other segment of, of, of buyers are just saying, you know what? I need something. I want it now. So right now I do have a few buyers that I'm working with that are quite active that, you know, they need to buy something and they want to buy it now and they want to move in soon or they're investors who happen to have all cash. So they want to get out there and buy. Mm -hmm. um, something I've also seen is assignment sales. A lot of them, a lot more than I've had before. I recently saw one that was, it was even written on the listing. It's a fire assignment sale. So <laughs> this is someone who bought a townhouse in 2018 for just under 1.4 million. It's about a 1400 square foot, two story, beautiful townhouse. And the MLS listing has been dropped to $899,000 wow. because they were holding back on offers in order to get the price up. And in the listing, it says that the buyer must be able to close by January the 31st. Uh-oh. <laughs> and so, hence the reason why the listing said fire assignment sale. Yeah. So I'm just now trying to connect with that agent to say, let me know if your client's really desperate because my clients will give them $900,000 cash and like, and close by January the 31st. Yeah. I, I know her client has already given $300,000 in deposits to the developer and obviously doesn't want to walk away um, at $900,000, but January the 31st is coming up. And, uh, you know, because interest rates have gotten so high and people are being stress tested, it's not that easy for people to get mortgages anymore. And I've been hearing from real estate lawyers who are saying when they go back to the developers to say, hey, we need more time to close, the developer is saying, okay, uh, you're going to be charged $600 a day uh, for that extension that you're asking for because they also have bills to pay. They don't have deep pockets and they also have to finance that. Mm -hmm. So it's just this circle of people trying to, you know, roll that ball down the hill in terms of, you know, being able to push out when they actually have to give up all that money. So I just feel like in the months to come, especially in that assignment market, um, things are going to get, I think, difficult for quite a few buyers and or I should say sellers um, because they need out and they need out quickly because the developers aren't letting them off the hook. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, you, you never know when when someone buys a pre-construction condominium three or four years out, how much their life has changed during that that period, right? They may have bought and decided to buy something else. They may have uh, lost their job. They may have counted on selling their house at X, and then for whatever reason, they maybe they they got divorced or they had their son move back in, and their 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 costs have changed, right? So it's not always you know, as, as, as much as, you know, you, you see on the online, it's just someone making a bad purchase and they were a speculator and now they're getting burned. Ha ha. Right. You know, I think there's, there's legit reasons why some people can no longer afford uh, something that they bought. And I think they deserve a little bit of sympathy yeah. <laughs> for, their, for their situation. But ultimately, whenever you buy real estate, it's, it's buyer beware, right? You could, uh, you could, 
you could lose money and you can and you can make money and and um unfortunately like i said that volatility that we've experienced in the market has been been crazy i mean so it's always interesting because some people you, you buy you're buying in the same real estate market and you're you know you've got this you know exactly decade, uh, so it's not as important but when you're a first time buyer trying to sometimes trying to time that market's really scary right because you're 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 making that huge commitment and you don't want to go and buy and then three months later you realize your house is worth 15 percent less than you just paid for right and that's that's pretty scary your, your entire down payment has essentially just been wiped out in a in a few months right uh, and that's uh, and that's certainly scary um but you also in this interest rate environment you may not want to wait and, and find that your carry cost is now 400 dollars a month higher because you didn't pull the trigger on the exact same unit that you were looking at that was been on the market for 90 days right so uh it's certainly True. not a Certainly not an easy time, and, and you know, I certainly I just redid my mortgage, and it's twice as much. You know, the, the interest oh. rate is, is, is twice as high as it was. Not the the payment, but the the uh, the, the the interest rate that I'm paying is twice as much, right? So that was a that was a oh god moment, right? Uh, uh. It, it, you know, what I you know I, I knew it was coming, but when yes. you see it on paper, you're you're oh right, you know that's that's painful, but. Uh, you know, it's 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 what you it's what you sign up for, and and uh, that's why you give yourself a little bit of buffer in the bank and save for a rainy day, and and, and hopefully uh, hopefully some people have been able to, to save for a rainy day because it's going to be uh, it should be interesting when when some of these five year mortgages run out and and people are going from uh, you know a a two point six or a two point seven to a five point eight or point yeah. nine or something, right? You know that's that's uh that's quite a shock to the system yeah absolutely and i mean i think this is all this is really a learning lesson for all of us in terms of markets being cyclical and i know that there are older people who've said that for years but those of us who are younger we haven't lived through this so we just didn't know right so i feel like we will all live differently now after we've all had this learned experience about what can happen within a higher interest rate environment and you know, as you said, all things are relative. It's higher to us, but really, it's not that high because, you know, I think back to when my mom owned real estate when I was growing up in the ninety early nineties, and you know, it was double digit interest rates. You know, it was thirteen percent. So rates aren't that high; they're just higher than what we've used been used to. But you know what? We're, we're going to get through this. Um, yeah. It will be this nice is- if the banks started to pay us interest, seeing that they're. <laughs> lending money out at seven <laughs> percent yeah where's my interest on my checking account or my or my savings account right so it That's seems like they're, they're, they're getting away with uh with lending our money out at a high rate but not giving us anything for it I, I remember when i actually used to get interest on my account now it's just oh you made a transaction oh, give me a dollar fifty you're right <laughs> I know you, you took twenty dollars out. Yeah, give me a dollar fifty for that. That was such a hassle for us. To, to, to do for you, right? <laughs> That's so true. Oh my God. Anyways, on that happy note, Ben, thanks so much for joining me today. This has been uh, awesome. It's been no a great problem. conversation. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Awesome.